seven. New? There were agents on each side of him, and Sylvanshine thought it a bit odd that it was the one with the pink little timorous face of a hamster who turned as if to address him, but the one on the other side looking away who had said it. New. They were four rows back from the driver, about whose posture in his seat there was something odd. As opposed to what? Sylvanshine's neck down through his shoulder blade was on fire, and he could feel the start of a jumping muscle in one of his eyelids. Explain the tax treatment of somebody giving appreciated stock to a charity versus that same person selling the stock and giving proceeds to the charity. The sides of the rural road looked chewed. The light outside was the sort of light that makes you turn on your headlights, but then keeps them from doing any good because technically it's still light out. It was unclear if this was a van or a max capacity 24 bus. The one who'd asked had a sideburn and the invulnerable smile of someone who's had two airport cocktails and nothing but nuts. The driver of the last van, to which Sylvanshine, as a GS9, had been assigned, rode the wheel as if his shoulders were too heavy for his back, as if clinging to the wheel to support himself. What kind of driver wore a white paper cap? A straw was all that held the vertiginous pile of bags in place. I'm the special assistant to the new Human Resources Systems Deputy, whose name is Merrill Lerrell, who is coming soon. New to the post. Freshly assigned, I meant. The man's voice was clear, even though he seemed to address the window, which was unclean. Sylvanshine felt hemmed in. The seats were more a cushioned bench, and there were no armrests to provide even the illusion or impression of personal space. Plus, the van swayed alarmingly on the road, which was either a road or a sort of rural highway, and you could hear the chassis springs. The rodential man, whose aura was timid but kind, a sad, kind man who lived in a cube of fear, had his hat in his lap. Capacity 24 and full. There was the yeasty smell of wet men, the energy was low. They were all coming back from something that had consumed a lot of energy. Sylvanshine could almost literally see the small pink man drinking Pepto-Bismol straight out of the bottle and going home to a woman who treated him like an uninteresting stranger. The two men either worked together or knew each other very well. They were talking in tandem without even being quite aware of it. An alpha-beta tandem, which meant either audit or CID. It occurred to Sylvanshine that the window held a faint oblique reflection of him, and that the alpha of the two men was amusing himself slightly by addressing Sylvanshine's reflection as if it were him, while the hamster affected the facial expression of address but said nothing. Stock donations are disguised capital gains treatments. There was also a sound, gassy and tinkly like half a bar of calipi, when the driver downshifted or the boxy van swayed hard on a reverse S next to a billboard that read, Downsize this, and then a picture Sylvanshine didn't catch, and while the urbane man was offhandedly introducing them, Sylvanshine didn't catch the names, which he knew would cause trouble because it was insulting to have forgotten people's names, especially if you were attached to an alleged Wunderkind in personnel, and personnel was your business. And you would have to go through all sorts of conversational gymnastics in the future to avoid using their names, and God help him if they were climbers and expected one day to come up and have him make introductions to Merrill, Although if they were a CID, this would be less likely, because investigations and fraud usually had their own infrastructure and office space, often in a separate building, at least in Rome and Philly, because forensic accountants liked to think of themselves more as law enforcement than service, and didn't, as a rule, much mix. And in fact, the taller man, Bondurant, did identify both himself and Britain as CID GS9s, which Sylvanshine was too occupied with mortification at missing their names to internalise until much later that evening when he would recollect the substance of the conversation and experience a moment of relief. The timorous man rarely lied. The more urbane CID agent lied rather a lot, Sylvanshine could feel. The window clicked with a fine rain, the sort of rain that stabs you but doesn't get you wet. Little drops, tiny drops, peened on the glass in which the less strictly dependable of the two cupped his chin and let out a sigh that was at least partly for effect. Somewhere behind was the sound of a handheld video game and the small sounds of other agents watching the game's progress over the shoulder of the man who was playing the game, who was silent.
The van, or buses, wipers, made a small shrieking sound on every second pass. It occurred to Sylvanshine that the driver looked as if he was almost resting his chin on top of the wheel because he was leaning way forward to try to get closer to the windshield, the way anxious people, or people with poor eyesight, will do when they're having trouble seeing. The slicker of the two CIDs in the window had an almost kite-shaped face, both square and pointy at the cheekbones and chin. Bondurant could feel the sharp pressure of his chin in his palm and the way the edge of the window's casement dug in a straight line between the bones of his elbow. Everyone but Sylvanshine knew where they'd all been and what they'd been doing in Joliet. But none of them were thinking about it in any kind of informative way, because that's not how people think about what they've just done. From outside the vehicle, it was clear what it was, both the shape and the sway of it, as well as the fact that the top layer of tan paint had been shoddily applied, and in places the headlights of the cars behind it picked up flashes of the bright colours beneath, the ballooned letters and icons on stacks at angles that suggested yumminess in some mysterious way only children get. Inside was the sound of the engine and the fluctuant murmur of small conversations melted by anticipation of the end of something. A conference or retreat, perhaps, or maybe an in-service training. Rome personnel had always been going to Buffalo or Manhattan for in-service trainings. And the handheld game, and a slight rustle or twitter in the breathing of the pale pink fellow, who Sylvanshine could feel was looking at the right side of his face, and the sound of Bondurant asking Sylvanshine about the Rome Post CID division, and from one spot ahead and one behind and to the right, the tinny whisper of people listening to things on possible headphones, a sure sign of a younger agent. And it occurred to Sylvanshine that the last time he'd seen any sort of black or Latin person had been at the Chicago airport that wasn't O'Hare, but he couldn't quite seem to lasso the name and felt odd getting his ticket receipt out of his case while the smaller appeared to be watching him, waiting for him to do something that would betray some sort of inadequacy or deficit in retention. Describe the advantages of octal machine language over binary machine language in designing a level 2 program for tracking regularities in the cash flow sheets of related corporations. Name two essential advantages for a franchise to filing schedule 2050 returns as a subsidiary of its parent company rather than filing as an autonomous corporate entity. And there it was again, the snatch of forced air music that Sylvanshine couldn't place, but made him want to leave his seat and go chase something on foot in the company of all the children in the neighbourhood, all of whom come boiling out of their respective front doors and hot-footing it up the street, holding currency aloft. And before he could think, Sylvanshine said, Bizarre as this sounds, can either of you every so often hear... Mr. Squishy now said the agent to his right in a baritone that didn't go with his body at all. Fourteen, Mr. Squishy. Iterant root frozen confection escort out of East Peoria truck seized together with office facilities, receivables, and equity holdings of four out of the seven members of the family who owned what the region's council convinced the Seventh Circuit was de facto a privately held escort, Bondurant said. Disgruntled employee falsified depreciation schedules for everything from freezers to trucks like this here. Jeopardy assessment, Sylvanshine said, mostly to show he knew the lingo. The seat directly ahead of Sylvanshine was unoccupied, yielding a view of the crossed and meaty neck of whoever sat ahead of that, his head covered by a bush hat pushed back to communicate relaxation and informality. This is an ice cream truck. Wonderful for morale, isn't it? Like, the paint job fools anybody that you've got the post's cream riding back in something that used to sell Nutty Buddies and was driven by a guy in a big lumpy white outfit and rubbered face so he looked like a blancmange. Driver used to drive this for Mr. Squishy. That's why we're going so slowly. Limits 55. Take a look at what's all stacked up behind us flashing their brights if you want. The smaller, pinker man, Britain, had a round, downy face. He was in his thirties, and it wasn't clear if he shaved. The odd thing was that Sylvanshine's neighbourhood in King of Prussia had been a planned community, with speed bumps, whose neighbourhood association had prohibited solicitation of any kind, especially with a calliope. 
Silvenshine had never in his life chased an ice cream truck. Driver still bonded. The seizure just went through last quarter. The DD decides that the margin on keeping the trucks and drivers in service through the length of the bond so outweighs what's realized auctioning them that everybody below G11 now rides in Mr. Squishy trucks, Bondurant said. His hand moved with his chin when he spoke, which struck Silvenshine as awkward-looking and false. Mrs. Short-run thinking. Terrible for morale, not to mention the PR debacle of kids and their parents seeing trucks they associate with innocence and delicious caramel crunch push-ups now seized and, as it were, shanghaied by the service, including surveillance. We conduct surveillance in these trucks, if you can believe it. They practically throw stones. Mr. Squishy. Some of the music's worse. Some of the trucks, there's a snatch of it every time they shift. They passed another sign, this out the right side, but Silvenshine could see it. It's spring. Think farm safety. Bondurant, ass tired from two days in a folding chair, was looking without really looking at a twelve-acre expanse of cornfield. They ploughed the corn stalks under just as they were harrowing the fields for seed in April, instead of ploughing them under in the fall so they'd have all the winter to rot and fertilise the ground, which, with organophosphate fertilizers and such, Bondurant supposed it wasn't worth the two days in the fall to plough them under. Plus, for some reason, Higgs's daddy had told him, but he'd forgot they liked to have the ground all clotted up in the winter. It protected something about the ground. And without being aware of it, found himself thinking about the nubbly field, reminiscent of the armpit of a girl who didn't shave her armpits very often, and without being conscious of any of the connections between the field that now passed and was replaced in the window by a stand of wild oak, and the armpit and the girl was thinking in a misdirected way of Cheryl Ann Higgs, now Cheryl Ann Standish, and now a data entry girl at American Twine, and a divorced mother of two in a double wide trailer her ex had apparently been arrested for trying to burn up shortly after Bondurant got GS9 over to CID who'd been his date at Peoria Central Catholic Prom in 71, when they both made prom court, and Bondurant was second runner-up to King and wore a powder blue tux and rented shoes too skinny for his feet. And she didn't fuck him that night even at post-prom when all the other fellows took turns getting fucked by their dates in the black and gold Chrysler New Yorker. They'd gone in and rented for the night from the shortstop's daddy at Hertz and got stains in so the shortstop had to spend the summer out at the airport at the Hertz desk working off the detailing of the New Yorker. Danny something. His daddy died not much later. But he couldn't play Legion ball that summer because of it, and couldn't stay sharp and barely made the team in college ball at NIU, and lost his scholarship, and God knows what all became of him, but none of the stains were Bondurant and Cheryl Ann Higgs's, despite all his entreaties. He hadn't used the bottle of schnapps, because if he brought her home drunk, her daddy would have either killed him or grounded her. Bondurant's life's greatest moment so far was on... 5-18-73, as a sophomore and the pinch-hit triple in the last home game at Bradley that drove Osnovitz, the future AAA catcher, to beat SIU Edwardsville and get Bradley into the Missouri Valley playoffs, which they lost, but still hardly a day at the desk with his feet up and clipboards stacked in his lap, goes by that he doesn't see the balloon of the SIU slider hanging and feel the vibrationless thip of the meat on the back connecting and hear the two-bell clatter of the aluminum bat fall as he sees the ball kind of pinball off the one F fence post by the foul line and twang off the other fence of the foul line. And see, and he could swear here, both fences jingle from the force of the ball, which he hit so hard he'll feel it forever, but can't summon anywhere near that kind of recall of what Cheryl Ann Higgs felt like when he slipped inside her on a blanket by the pond out back past the stand, past the edge of the pasture of the small dairy spread Mr. Higgs and one of his uncountable brothers operated. Though he does well remember what each of them had been wearing, and the smell of the pond's new algae near the runoff pipe, whose gurgle was nearly brook-like. And the look on Cheryl Ann Higgs's face as her posture and supine position became acquiescent, and Bondurant had known he was home free, as they say, but had avoided her eyes because the expression in Cheryl Ann's eyes, which without ever once again thinking about it, Tom Bondurant had never forgotten, was one of blank terminal sadness. Not so much that of a pheasant in a dog's jaws, as of a person who's about to transfer something he knows in advance he can never get sufficient return on. The next year had seen them drop into the crazy obsessive love spiral, 
in which they'd break up and then not be able to stay away from each other, until one time she was able to stay away, and that was all she wrote. The small, light pink CID agent Britton had, without any sort of throat clearing or segue, asked Sylvanshine what he was thinking, which seemed to Sylvanshine grotesquely and almost obscenely inappropriate and invasive, rather like asking what your wife looked like naked or what your private restroom function smelled like. But of course, it would be impossible to say any of this aloud, particularly for someone whose job here involved cultivating good relations and uncluttered lines of communication for Merrill Lerrell to exploit when he arrived, to mediate for Merrill Lerrell, and to at once gather information on as many aspects and issues involved in the examination of returns as possible, since there were some difficult, delicate decisions to make, decisions whose import extended far beyond this provincial post, and any way it went, it was going to be painful. Sylvanshine, turning slightly, but not all the way, a flare of orange in his left shoulder blade, to meet at last Gary Britton's left eye, realized that he had very little emotional or ethical read on Britton, or anyone on the bus but Bondurant, who was having some kind of wistful memory and was cultivating the wistfulness, reclining a bit in it as one would in a warm bath. When something large and oncoming passed, the windshield's big rectangle was for a moment incandescent and opaque with water, which the wipers heaved mightily to displace. Britain's gaze seemed to Sylvanshine more like looking at his right eye than into it. At this time it moved through Thomas Bondurant's mind, which lended to be tornadic, as he looked out the window, but more back and in at his own memory, that one could look out a window, look in a window, as there was the gold ponytail and a flash of creamy shoulder in the window, through a window, close to out, or even at a window, as in examining the pane's clarity and whether it was clean. The gaze nevertheless seemed to be one of expectancy, and Sylvanshine felt again past the emptiness of his stomach and the pinched nerve in his clavicle how opaque the bus's overall mood was, and different from the horror-fraught tension of the Philadelphia 0104's 170 agents or the manic torpor of tiny 408's dozen in Rome. His own mood... The complex hybrid of destination fatigue and anticipatory fear one feels at the end not of a journey but a move did not in any way complement the mood of the former squishy truck, nor of the urbane wistful older agent to his left, nor of the human blank spot who would asked an invasive question, whose honest answer would entail acknowledging the invasion, putting Sylvanshine in a personnel relations bind before he'd even arrived at the post which seemed for a moment terribly unfair, and flushed Sylvanshine with self-pity, a feeling not as dark as the wing of despair, but tinged carmine with a resentment that was both better and worse than ordinary anger, because it had no specific object. There seemed no one in particular to blame. Something in Gary or Jerry Britton's aspect made it obvious that his question was some inevitable extension of his character and that he was no more to be blamed for it than an ant was to be blamed for crawling on your potato salad at a picnic. Creatures just did what they did. 8. Under the sign erected every May above the outer highway, reading, It's spring, think farm safety, and through the north ingress with its own defaced name and signs addressed to soliciting and speed and universal glyph for children at play, and down the blacktop's gauntlet of double-wide showpieces, past the Rottweiler humping nothing in crazed spasms at chain's end, and the sound of frying through the kitchenette window of the trailer at the hairpin right and then hard left along the length of a speed bump into the dense copse, as yet uncleared for new single-wides, and the sound of dry things snapping and stridulation of bugs in the duff of the copse, and the two bottles and bright plastic packet impaled on the mulberry twig, seeing through shifting parallax of saplings branches sections then of trailers along the north parks and fractuous roads and lanes skirting the corrugate trailer, where it was said the man left his family and returned some time later with a gun and killed them all as they watched Dragnet and the torn, abandoned, sixteen-wide, half-overgrown by the edge of the copse where boys and their girls made strange, agnate forms on pallets and left bright torn packs until a mishap with a stove blew the gas lead and ruptured the trailer's south wall 
in a great labial tear that exposes the trailer's gutted insides to view from the edge of the copse and the plurality of eyes as the needles and stems of a long winter noisomely crunch beneath the plurality of shoes where the copse leaves off at a tangent past the end of the undeveloped cul-de-sac where they come now at dusk to watch the parked car heave on its springs. The windows steamed nearly opaque and so alive in the chassis that it seems to move without running, the boat-sized car, squeak of struts and absorbers, and a jiggle just short of true rhythm. The birds at dusk and the smell of snapped pine and a younger one's cinnamon gum. The shimmying motions resemble those of a car travelling at high speeds along a bad road, making the Buick static aspect dreamy and freighted with something like romance or death in the gaze of the girls who squat at the copse's risen edge, appearing dyadic, and eyes half again as wide and solemn, watching for the sometime passage of a limb's pale shape past a window, once a bare foot flat against it and itself a tremble, moving incrementally forward and down each night in the week before true spring, soundlessly daring one another to go get up close to the heaving car and see in, which the only one who finally does so then sees not, but her own wide eyes reflected as from inside the glass comes a cry she knows too well, which wakes her again each time across the trailer's cardboard wall. There were fires in the gypsum hills to the north, the smoke of which hung and stank of salt. Then the pewter earrings vanished without complaint or even mention. Then a whole night's absence, two, the child as mother to the woman. These were auguries and signs. Tony Ware and her mother abroad again in endless night. Roots on maps that yield no sensible shape or figure when traced. At night from the trailer's park, the hills possessed of a dirty orange glow, and the sounds of living trees exploding in the fire's heat did carry and the noise of planes ploughing the undulant air above and dropping thick tongues of talc. Some nights it rained fine ash, which, upon contacting, turned to soot and kept all souls indoors, such that throughout the park every trailer's window possessed of the underwater glow of televisions, and when many were identically tuned, the sounds of the programmes came clear to the girl through the ash, as if their own television was still with them. It had vanished without comment prior to their last move. That last time's sign. The park's boys wore wide, rumpled hats and cravats of thong, and some displayed turquoise about their person. And of these, one helped her empty the trailer's sanitary tank, and then pressed her to fillet him in recompense, whereupon she promised that anything emerging from his trousers would not return there. No boy near her size had successfully pressed her since Houston, and the two who put something in her pop that made them turn sideways in the air, and she could not then fight and lay watching the sky while they did their distant business. At sunset then, the north and west were the same colour. On clear nights she could read by the night sky's ember light seated on the plastic box that served as stoop. The screen door had no screen, but was still a screen door, which fact she thought upon. She could finger-paint in the soot on the kitchenette's range top, in incendiary orange to the deepening twilight in the smell of creosote burning in the sharp hills upwind. Her inner life rich and multivalent. In fantasies of romance, it was she who fought and overcame thereon to rescue some object or figure that never in the reverie resolved or took to itself any shape or name. After Houston, her favourite doll had been the mere head of a doll, its hair prolixly done and the head's whole threaded to meet a neck's own thread. She had been eight when the body was lost, and it lay now forever supine and unknowing in weeds, while its head lived on. The mother's relational skills were indifferent, and did not include truthful or consistent speech. The daughter had learned to trust actions and to read sign in details of which the run of children are innocent. The battered road atlas had then appeared and lay athwart the counter's medial crack, opened to the mother's home state, over whose representation of her place of origin lay a spore of dried mucus, spindled through with a red thread of blood. The atlas stayed open that way nigh on one week, unreferred to. 
They ate around it. It gathered wind-drift ash through the torn screen. Ants vexed all the park's trailers, there being something in the fire's ash they craved. Their point of formication, the high place where the kitchenette's wood grain panelling had detached in prior heat and bowed outward, and from which two vascular parallel columns of black ants descended. Standing eating out of cans at the anodized sink. Two flashlights and a drawer with different bits of candles, which the mother eschewed for her cigarettes, were her light unto the world. A little box of borax in each of the kitchenette's corners. The water in buckets from the coin wash tap. The trailer, a standalone with sides, wires hanging, and its owner's whereabouts unreckoned by the park's elders, whose lawn chairs sat unmolested by ash in the smoke tree's central shade. One of these... Mother Tia told fortunes, leathery and tremorous, and her face like a shucked pecan fully cowled in black, and two isolate teeth like a spare at the show-me lanes, and owned her own cards and tray on which what ash collected showed white, calling her Chula, and charging her no tariff on terms of the evil eye she claimed to fear when the girl looked at her through the screen's hole with the telescope of her old magazine. Two ribby and yellow-eyed dogs lay throbbing in the smoke-tree shade and rose only sometimes to bay at the plains as they harried the fires. The sun overhead, like a peephole, into hell's own self-consuming heart. Yet one more sign being when Mother Tear refused then to augur and doing so in terms of pleading for clemency, instead of bare refusal to the reedy laughter of the Shade's other elders and widows. No one understood why she feared the girl, and she would not say, though a lip caught behind one tooth as she traced the special letter over and over on nothing in the air before her, whom she would miss, and whose memory in trust, therefore, the doll's head also would carry. The mother's relational skills being indifferent to this degree, since the period of clinical confinement in University City M.O., wherein the mother had been denied visits for 18 business days, and the girl had evaded family services during this period, and slept in an abandoned Dodge vehicle whose doors could be secured with coat hangers twisted just so. The girl looked often at the open atlas and the city thereon marked with a sneeze. She had herself been born there, just outside, in the town that bore her own name. Her second experience of the kind her books made seem sweet through indifferent speech had occurred in the abandoned car in University City M.O., at the hands of a man who knew how to dislodge one coat hanger with the straightened hook of another, and told her face beneath his fingerless mitten there were two different ways this right here could go. The longest time she had ever subsisted wholly on shoplifted food was eight days. Not more than a competent shoplifter. Their time at Moab UT, an associate once said that her pockets had no imagination, and was soon thereafter pinched and made to spear littered by the highway as she and the mother had passed in the converted camper driven by Kick, the seller of pyrite and self-made arrowheads around whom the mother said, not ever one word, but sat before the radio painting each nail a different colour, and who had once punched her stomach so hard she saw colours and smelled up close the carpet's grit base and could hear what her mother then did to distract Kick from further attentions to this girl with the mouth on her. This being also how she learned to cut a brake line so the failure would be delayed until such a time as the depth of the cut determined. At night, on the pallet in the ruddled glow, she dreamt also of a bench by a pond and the somnolent mutter of ducks, while the girl held the string of something that floated above with a painted face, a kite or balloon, of another girl she would never see or know of. Once on the nation's interstate highway system, the mother had spoken of a headless doll she herself had kept and clung to through the hell-on-earth years of her Peoria girlhood, and her own mother's nervous illness, her profile bunched up as she pronounced it, during which the mother's mother had refused to let her outside the house over which she had engaged itinerant men 
to nail found and abandoned hubcaps to every inch of the exterior in order to deflect the transmissions of one Jack Benny, a rich man whom the grandmother had come to believe was insane and sought global thought control by radio wave of a special pitch and hue. Nobody that means gonna let the world go was an indirect quotation or hearsay when driving, which the mother could do while simultaneously smoking and using an emery board. The girl made it her business to read signs and know the facts of her own history, past and present. To beat broken glass into powder requires an hour with a portion of brick on a durable surface. She had shoplifted ground chuck and buns and kneaded powdered glass into the meat and cooked it on a window screen brazier at the rear of the abandoned dodge and had left such painstaking meals of sandwich on the front seat for days running before the man who had pressed her used his coat hanger tool to jimmy the vehicle and steal them, whereupon he returned no more. The mother then released into the girl's care soon. Imbrication by disc is impossible, but the grandmother's specifications were that each hubcap touch those on every possible side. Thus the electrification of one became the charge of all to counter the wave's bombardment. The creation of a lethal field which jammed radios all down the block. Twice sighted for diverting the home's amperage, the old woman had found a generator someplace that would run, if noisily, on kerosene, and bounced and shook beside the bomb-shaped propane tank outside the kitchen. The young mother was sometimes permitted outside to bury the sparrows that are lit on the home and sent up their souls in a single flash and bird-shaped ball of smoke. The girl read stories about horses, bios, science, psychiatry, and popular mechanics when obtainable. She read history in a determined way. She read My Struggle and could not understand all the fuss. She read Wells, Steinbeck, Keane, Laura Wilder, twice, and Lovecraft. She read halves of many torn and cast-off things. She read a coverless red badge and knew by sheer feel that its author had never seen war, nor knew that past some extremity one floated just above the fear and could blinklessly watch it while doing what had to be done or allowed to stay alive. The trailer park's boy who had pressed her there in the hanging smell of their own sewage now assembled his friends outside the trailer at night there to lurk and make inhuman sounds in the ashfall as the daughter's daughter drew circles within circles about her own given name on the map and the arteries leading thereto. The gypsum fires and the park's lit sign with the poles of the desert night. The boys burped and howled at the moon, and the howls were nothing like the real thing, and their laughter was strained, and words indifferent to the love, they said, swelled them and would visit upon her past counting. In these, the mother's absences with men, the girl sent for catalogues and free offers, which daily did arrive by mail with samples of products that people with homes would buy to enjoy at their leisure, like the girl, who considered herself home-tutored and did not ride the bus with the park's children. These all possessed the stunned, smeared look of those who were poor in one place. The trailers, sign, and passing trucks were the furniture of their world which orbited but did not turn. The girl often imagined them in a rear view, receding, both arms raised in farewell. As bestos cloth cut carefully into strips, one of which placed in the pay dryer when the mother of the would-be assailant had deposited her load and returned to the Circle K for more beer, caused neither the boy nor the mother to be seen any more outside their double wide, which rested on blocks. The boy's serenades ceased as well. A soup can of sewage or roadkill carcass, when placed beneath the blocks or plasticized lattice of a store-bought porch attachment, would fill and afflict that trailer with a plague's worth of soft-bodied flies. A shade tree could be killed by driving a short length of copper tubing into its base a hand's breadth from ground. The leaves would commence to embrown straight away. The trick with the brake or fuel line was to use strippers to wet it to almost nothing instead of cutting it clean through. It took a certain feel. 
Half an ounce of packets aggregate sugar in the gas tank disabled all vehicles but required no art. Likewise, a penny in the fuse box or red dye in a trailer's water tank accessible through the sanitation panel on all but late year models of which the Vista Verde Park had none. Begat in one car and born in another, creeping up in dreams to see her own conceiving. The desert possessed of no echo, and in this was like the sea from which it came. Sometimes at night the sands of the fire carried, or the circling plains, or those of long-haul trucks on 54 for Santa Fe, whose tires, plaint, had the quality of distant surf's lilation. She lay listening on the pallet and imagined not the sea or the moving trucks themselves, but whatever she right then chose. Unlike the mother or bodiless doll, she was free inside her head, an unbound genius larger than any sun. The girl read a biography of Hetty Green, the matricide and accused forger who had dominated the stock market while saving scraps of soap in a dented tin box she carried on her person, and who feared no living soul. She read Macbeth as a colour comic with dialogue in boxes. The performer Jack Benny had cupped his own face with a hand in a manner the mother, when lucid, had told her she'd seen as tender and pined for, dreamt of, inside the home and its carapace of electric shields, while her own mother wrote letters to the FBI in code. Near sunrise the red plains to the east undimmed, and the terrible imperious heat of the day bestirred in its underground den. The girl placed the doll's head on the sill to watch the red eye open, and small rocks and bits of litter cast shadows as long as a man. Never once in five states worn a dress or leather shoes. At dawn of the fire's eighth day, her mother appeared in a vehicle made large by its corrugated shell, behind whose wheel sat an unknown male. The side of the shell said, Lear. Thought blocking over inclusion. Vagueness over speculation, woolly thinking, confabulation. Word salad, stonewalling, aphasia, delusions of persecution, catatonic immobility, automatic obedience, affective flattening, dilute I thou, disordered cognition, loosened or obscure associations, depersonalization, delusions of centrality or grandeur, compulsivity, ritualism, hysterical blindness, promiscuity. Solipsismus or ecstatic states. Rare. This girl's date slash place of birth. 11 four, sixty, Antony, Illinois. Girl's mother's date slash place of birth. 4843, Peoria, Illinois. Most recent address. 17 Dos Wallops Unit E, Vista Verde Estates Mobile Home Park, Oregon, New Mexico. 88052. Girls, height, weight, eye color, hair color. 5'3", 95 pounds, brown, brown. Mother's stated occupations, 1966 to 1972, from IRS Form 669-D, Certificate of Subordination of Federal Tax Lien, District 063-A, 1972. Cafeteria Edition Food Area Cleaning Assistant. Rayburn Thrap, Argonomics, Antony, Illinois. Skilled operator of silk screen press until injury to wrist. All City Uniform Company, Alton, Illinois. Cashier, Convenient Food Mark Corporation, Norman, Oklahoma, and Jacinto City, Texas. Server, Stucky's Restaurants Corps, Limon, Colorado. Assistant Adhesive Product Mixing Scheduling Clark, National Starch and Chemical Company, University City, Missouri. Hostess and beverage server, Double Juice Live Stage Nightclub, Lordsburg, New Mexico. Contract vendor, Cavalry Temporary Services, Moab, Utah. Canine Confinement Area Organization and Cleaning, Best Friends Kennel and Groom, Green Valley, Arizona. Ticket Agent and Substitute Night Manager, Risque's Live XX Adult Entertainment, Las Cruces, New Mexico. They drove then once more at night, below a moon that rose round before them. 
What was termed the truck's back seat was a narrow shelf on which the girl could sleep if she arranged her legs in the gap behind the real seats, whose headrests possessed the dull shine of unwashed hair. The clutter and yeast smell bespoke a truck that was or had been lived in. The truck and its man smelled the same. The girl in cotton bodice and her jeans gone fugitive at the knees. The mother's conception of man was that she used them as a sorceress, will, dumb animals, as sign and object of her unnatural powers. Her spoken word allowed for these at which the girl gave no reproof, familiar. Swart and sideburn men who sucked wooden matches and crushed cans with their hands, whose hats' brims had sweat lines like the rings of trees, whose eyes crawled over you in the rear view. Men inconceivable as ever themselves being children or looking up naked at someone they trust with a toy, to whom the mother talked like babies and let them treat her like a headless doll. Manhandle. At an Amarillo motel, the girl had her own locked room out of earshot. The hangers were affixed to the closet's rod. The doll's head wore lipstick of pink crayon and looked at TV. The girl often wished she had a cat or some small pet to feed and reassure as she stroked its head. The mother feared winged insects and carried cans of spray, mace on a chain and melted cosmetics, and her faux leather snap case for cigarettes and lighter, at once in a handbag of imbricate red sequins the girl had produced for Christmas in Green Valley. With only a very small tear near the base, where the electronic tag had been forced through the file and then used to carry out the same bodice the girl now wore, on which stitched pink hearts formed a fence line at breast level. The truck smelled also of spoilt provision, and had a window with vanished crank he rolled up and down with pliers. A card taped to one visor proclaimed that hairdressers teased it till it did stand up. His teeth were missing at one side. The glove box was locked. The mother at thirty, with face commencing to display the faint seams of the plan for the second face life had in store for her, and which she feared would be her own mother's, and in university cities confined time, sat with knees bunched up, rocking, and scratched at herself, essaying to ruin the face's plan. The sepia photo of the mother's mother at the girl's own age in a pinafore on horsehair seat rolled into the doll's head and carried with soap scraps and three library cards in her given name her diary in the round case's second lining, and the lone photo of her mother as a child outdoors in winter dazzle, in so many coats and hats that she and the propane tank might be kin. The electrified house out of view and the circle of snowmelt around its base, and the mother behind the little mother holding her upright. The child had had croup, and such a fever she was feared not to live, and her mother had realized she had no pictures of her baby to keep if she died, and had bundled her up and sent her out into the snow to wait while she bagged a snapshot with a neighbor's land camera so her baby might not be forgotten when she died. The photo distorted from long folding and no footprints in view anywhere in the picture's snow that the girl could see, the child's mouth wide open and eyes looking up at the man with the camera in trust that this made sense. This was how right life occurred. The girl's plans for the grandmother, much refined with age and a crude art, occupied much of the latest diaries, first, third. Her mother, and not the male, was at the wheel when she woke to the clatter of gravel in Kansas. A truck stop proceeded as something upright ran in the road behind them and waved its hat. She asked where they were, but did not ask after the man, who, through three states, had driven with the same offending hand on the mother's thigh that had touched her. A hand studied through the seat's gap by the doll's head, held just so, and its detachment and airborne flight seen in the same dream the lurch and sounds first seemed part of. The daughter, thirteen now, and starting to look it, her mother's eyes were distant and low-lidded in the company of men. Now in Kansas she made faces at the rear view and chewed gum. Right up front, up out of there, up here, why don't you? The gum smelt cinnamon, and its folded foil could make a glove box pick by wrapping round to smooth the file's emery at the point. Outside a portale's rest stop, under a sun of beaten gold, 
The girl supine and half asleep in a porous nap on the little back shelf had suffered the man to hoist himself about behind the truck's wheel and form his hand into an unsensual claw and send it out over the seat back to squeeze her personal titty, to throttle the titty, eyes pale and unprurient, she playing dead and staring unblinking past him, the man's breathing audible and khaki cap pungent, manhandling the titty with what seemed an absent dispassion, leaving off only at the high heels sound in the lot outside. Still a stark advance over the previous year's Caesar, who worked at painting hallway signs and had green grains forever in the pores of his face and hands and required both mother and girl to keep the washroom door open no matter what their business inside. Himself then in turn improved over Houston's district of warehouses and gutted lofts, whereat had fallen in with them for two months, Murray Blade, the semi-professional welder whose knife in its forearm spring clip covered a tattoo of just that knife between two ownerless blue breasts, the squeeze of a fist made swell at the sides which amused him. Men with leather vests and tempers who were tender when drunk in ways that made your back skin pebble up. The 54 Highway East was not federal, and the winds of oncoming rig struck the truck and its shell and caused your the mother steered against. All windows down against the man's stored smell. An unmentionable thing in the glove box the mother said to shut she couldn't look. The card with its entendre made French curls in their backwash and disappeared against the past road shimmer. West of Pratt, Kansas, they purchased and ate convenient mart burritos heated in the device provided for that purpose. A great, huge, unfinishable slushy. Behind her carapace of discs and foil, the mother's mother held, when Madman Jack Benny or his spiral-eyed slaves came for them, the best defense at hand was to play dead, to lie with blank eyes open and not blink or breathe while the men holstered their ray guns and walked about the house and looked at them, shrugging and telling one another they were too late because, look here, the woman and her nubile daughter were already deceased and best left be. Forced to practice together in the twin beds with open bottles of pills on the table betwixt and hands composed on their chests and eyes wide and breathing in such a slight way that the chest never rose. The older woman could hold her open eyes unblinking a very long time. The mother, as child, could not, and they soon enough closed of their own, for a living child is no doll, and does need to blink and breathe. The older woman said one could self-lubricate at will with the proper application of discipline and time. She said her decade on a carnival necklace, and had a small nickel lock on the mailbox. Windows covered with foil in the crescents between the cap's black circles. The mother carried drops and always claimed her eyes were dry. Riding up front was good. She did not ask about the truck's man. It was his truck they were in, but he was not in the truck. It was hard to locate something to complain about in this. The mother's relatings were least indifferent when the two faced the same. She made small jokes and sang and sent small looks the daughter's way. All the world beyond the reach of the headlamp's beams was much obscured. Hers was her grandmother's maiden name, where she could put her soles against the truck's black dash and look out between her knees, the whole of the headlight's tongue of row between them. The broken centerline shot morse at them, and the bone-white moon was round, and clouds moved across it and took shape as they did so. First fingers, then whole hands, and trees of lightning fluttered on the west horizon. Nothing came behind them. She kept looking for following lights or signs. The mother's lipstick was too bright for the shape of her mouth. The girl did not ask. The odds were high. The man was either the species of man who would file a report, or else would essay to follow like a second kick and find them, for leaving him waving his hat on the road. If she asked, the mother's face would go saggy as she thought of what to say when the truth was she hadn't thought at all. The girl's blessing, and a lot to know their two minds both as one, to hold the wheel as Murine was again applied. 
They had a sit-down breakfast in Pleplo, Missouri, in a rain that foamed the gutters and beat against the cafe's glass. The waitress in Nurse White had a craggy face and called them both honey, and wore a button which said, I have got but one nerve left, and you are upon that nerve, and flirted with the working man whose name she knew, while steam came out of the kitchen over the counter above which she clipped sheets from her pad, and the girl used their toothbrush in a restroom whose lock had no hasp. The front door's hung bell sounded on use to signal custom. The mother wanted biscuits and hash browns and mush with syrup, and they ordered, and the mother saw to dry a match, and soon the girl heard her laughing at something the man at the counter said. Rain rolled through the street, and cars passed slowly, and their truck, with its shell, faced the table and still had its parking lights on, which she saw, and saw also within her mind the truck's legal owner, still there in the road outside Kismet, holding his hands extended into claws at the space where the truck had receded from view while the mother beat the wheel and blew hair from her eyes. The girl dragged toast through her yoke. Of the two men who entered and filled the next booth, one had similar whiskers and eyes beneath a red cap, gone black with rain. The waitress with her little stub pencil and pad said unto these, What are you sitting in a dirty booth for? So as I can be closer to you, darling. Why, you could have sat over right there and been closer yet. Shoot.